So let me now introduce our first speaker, Hank from Red Cross International and Katia from Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And I will give the floor to them right now. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, still morning, at least in my uh, time zone. Uh, welcome. Um, first, a little bit of. Uh, 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 so we both, uh, so that's Katya from the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, and uh, we from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Organization Societies. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just name it Red Cross. I hope that you'll hope, uh, feel that that's okay uh, for now. Uh, we both did uh, an idea or uh, an idea to attempt to map camps in the refugee uh, crisis, during the refugee crisis. And both attempts are slightly a little bit different because um, in the Map Refugee project, it was mainly trying to map a informal camp in uh, Calais. You probably all read about it. Um, and we're trying to uh, do some mapping of, of camps that are official formal camps. So, I, and at some point I was kind of thinking like, it would be nice to just compare the two because it, they have different kind of dynamics uh, of what to do with it. So, um, I first want to just give the floor to, uh, 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 I would say a very successful project. Um, uh, Katya from uh, HOT, who's running the Map Fiji project. And she's going quickly through uh, the idea how they set up the whole project, how it worked, uh, and um, uh, what, the, uh, uh, what the outcomes are. And then afterwards, I'll be coming back and talk a little bit more about what we as the Federation uh, have done for mapping in Greece. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, it's, all, it's, all, it's all to keep you awake, because uh, I know Saturday is a difficult day. You've all been out doing whatever you've been doing on a Friday night. And it's, um, um, so there, uh, let's see how I can get up to the other uh, presentation. And we're there. So, uh, Katya, if you uh, want to go up. Uh, and tell us about what, I'll just need to get this kind of way. Tell us about the, uh, uh, pro uh, the project in Calais. Okay, thank you, Hank. Hi, <laughs> good morning. Um, so, as um, I was kindly introduced by Hank, um, this is about two participatory mapping projects. One um, took place in Dunkirk and one took place in Cali. These are two informal camps. The camp in Cali is um, semi-organized, semi-state-run, and the camp in Cali is um, not run by any NGO and also not run by the state. Uh, they're pretty much located here, as you can see. Um, and they're located at the border um, to the UK and also near to Belgium. And, and there are reasons why people are here. Um, yeah, mainly this, this image pretty much sums it up by they're here. They want to go to the UK and they cannot do so in a legal way. So um, they take um, alternative routes, let's call Caught it like that, so they tried to jump on lorries um, to sneak into cars um, to cross the borders. Oh, it's also um, possible to do it by paying people for taking them there. Um, most of them are fleeing war and conflict. Um, they come from very poor countries, or they have um, experienced ethnic or political um, oppression in their home countries. Um, the evolution of the camps. Both are pretty new camps. Dunkirk uh, was a makeshift camp uh, that um, originated in summer 2015 and the uh, conditions were um, really unacceptable. So MSF decided um, at the beginning of this year to construct a camp with their own money um, according to humanitarian standards. It has a very um, homogenic Population, mostly um, people from Kurdistan, um, from Iraq, Iran, Syria. Um, there is a large number of families in this camp, about 20%. Um, um, many, many kids running very fast on their bikes, and also a small number of unaccompanied minors. Um, yeah, this is an aerial image uh, of the camp, so you can 
really see it's nicely designed, very well structured. Um, while the camp in Cali is a real makeshift camp, a spontaneous camp, um, people started um, gathering there um, last year in spring, and half of the camp was evicted. Um, at the beginning of this year, uh, the French state is present with a container camp for 1,500 people. By now there are 10,000 residents and numbers are rising. Um, thousand unaccompanied minors and the population um, is of very mixed origin. So um, I think mm, the largest communities are from Afghanistan, Sudan. Um, many people coming now from Ethiopia and also um, Romo people. Eritrea is another country, um, and then, yeah, smaller populations from Pakistan, Kurdish people, Syria, and since some time, also Egyptian and Palestinian people. 98% in this camp uh, are men, and as I said, it's continuously growing, and especially uh, the number of unaccompanied minors uh, coming to the camp is varying. While I was there um, in July, there were about 10 new minors arriving each day. Um, both, as I already said, the camp in Dunkirk is semi-organized. There are many volunteer organizations present, uh, but also NGOs um, are responsible for something like health uh, or also wash. The sanitary conditions are very good compared to um, Calais, which is uh, mainly volunteer and also refugee run. There is a uh, um, there are many refugee community leaders who are really taking responsibility for what's going on in the camp. They have regular coordination meetings with NGOs and um, volunteer organizations. Um, yeah, NGOs present in the camp are um, acted with two people. MSF runs a youth center and uh, MDM offers psychosocial Support and as I said, the um, French government uh, provides 3,000 meals a day and runs the um, container camp. So the infrastructure in Dunkirk um, is really better. They have um, no public electricity, but street lamps and public Wi-Fi. Um, in Calais, as you can see, this is yeah usual place uh, in Calais. Um, so it doesn't uh, yeah they have an insufficient waste management, which is um, a major problem there. So this is what it looks like. Um, the housing in Dunkirk are really beautiful MSF boxes. Um, in Cali, uh, people are, the new arrivals are sleeping rough most of the time. There are small tents like this one, self-built structures, um, a mix of um, MSF boxes, caravans, mostly for families, and the container camps. The data situation we faced in Dunkirk was no geodata, no up-to-date imagery. Um, we had some CAD files. And um, in Cali, there's this one hand-drawn map, and um, there are three infoboids, and then there are three active maps. Um, and we had some data from UMAP. So the outreach. Um, we did at very um, central spaces. Uh, in Dunkirk, we were located at the Refugee Welcome Center, um, which is here, which um, in Calais, um, we had a kind of three methods of reaching people. So we had our headquarter at Jungle Box, which is a very popular place. And then we had temporary headquarters uh, to reach smaller communities and mobile mapping teams. Um, this is Jungle Books. This is uh, an example of our um, uh, temporary headquarters. And this is yeah, what mobile mapping looks like. So we were just recruiting people who were walking by, asking them if they wanted to map with us. The tools we used are yeah, very simple. It was field papers, um, drawing, garments, and uh, mapping on um, smartphones. So in Dunkirk, we were able to um, walk people through complete workflow. Uh, they had a strong learning curve, and um, they really um, built up their capacities and reactivated their skills. It was a lot of walking, collecting traces, a lot of field papering, and then getting the data, editing in JASM. Um, and in the end, it was an open street map. In Cali, it was totally different. Um, because there was a high fluctuation of people attending, 
um, but we got them involved uh, by creating um, their own maps, drawing them. So this is what it looks like in the end. This is the container camp where we didn't have access to, but um, there were nice refugee mappers who did that for us. Um, and they created, for example, color code. So this guy is 16 years old. Idris from Ethiopia, and he did this just on his own. We didn't influence him in any way. And I think he really got the point of a pretty good map. Um, then we had several games, um, just to find out what are the points of reference and um, how do people structure their daily life. And we did all the camp translations together with them. Um, in total, there were six languages. And we just attached the maps basically everywhere, at Jangala Radio, our classroom, and also at the Coptian Church. Um, the points of interest and area of interest uh, were in both camps, distribution points, uh, educational facilities, um, and also the free shops where they could get free um, food, like the snack shack, very popular, very good food. And then, yeah, Sam and Kali, um, they had just much more restaurants, um, like this one. Then communal kitchens, the Afran kitchen, refugee um, info bus with free Wi-Fi, the welcome van for new arrivals, another school, the church, of course, is a point of interest, and the mosque. Um, yeah, and football, there are a lot of sport activities going on, and this is an interesting point of interest because it's the embankment in there, and they have a good data connection. The challenges um, in both camps were the same, so presence of police, police raids, spontaneous fights breaking out, um, and the presence of um, mafia and gangs. Um, for people who don't know what this is, these are Tigas canisters, which are especially in Calais, um, yeah, police use them and seem to like them. Um, so the challenge for individual mappers is, of course, I mean, you need to be very resilient, self-aware of what's going on and aware of what's going on around you, flexible, and um, you, should be, you should have physical and mental health so, um, to survive. <laughs> So the outcome uh, in practical terms was, of course, the data is an awesome. Um, we had physical service maps, um, smaller maps for handout, and we also created a surroundings map and a bus, gui bus guide. Both was requested by the refugees. So in Cali, also data on awesome. Um, physical maps, one general camp map, and one map um, especially for the miners, which was requested by MSF. So that's it, and we were supported by really great organizations, Kahane Foundation, Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, which the logo is not really, um, yeah, it doesn't look very good, map box provided us with imagery. Thanks very much. <laughs> And Mapillary was technical equipment, and of course we had a lot of volunteers and remote contributors from OpenStreetMap, especially OpenStreetMap France, and many missing maps volunteers from the UK, and of course it wouldn't have been possible without all the refugee mappers. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I really love this project because um, it's uh, it also kind of triggered uh, us when uh, we were talking about we want to have maps from uh, camps. How should we do that? And the Map for G's project really proved the idea uh, we can do that together with. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so we can do that together with um, uh, with. Um, uh, 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 with refugees. So, uh, a little bit uh, background. Sorry, about, uh, so li a little bit of background on how the Red Cross is a little bit structured because it, it gives a little bit of uh, idea. So we have 190 uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent or uh, organizations in the various countries, uh, and they are basically doing most of the work. We have a federation where I'm currently working for, which is supporting uh, the national. Uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent organizations. Uh, if there's uh, extra need, we try to help in. Uh, and there's also then the ICRC, which basically covers if there's any uh, form of uh, conflict situations. So if you see in Syria, next to the uh, 
uh, uh, Syrian Arabic uh, Red Crescent organization. You also see the ICRC trying to get uh, food into Aleppo and, not, and these kind of organizations. Um, we work along the seven fundamental principles. You can look it up on the website if it's interesting. Um, and, uh, but, but, but it really kind of gives, we want to be independent. Uh, we really work with volunteers because we really try to engage with local communities, making them stronger. And also then the Federation here is, says we're trying to help support the local national um, uh, Red Cross organizations. Okay, back to uh, quickly where we are, uh, refugees. Uh, and if you then look at the various camps in Greece, because I'm now trying to focus on Greece, this is Idomeni. Uh, it's closed by now, but this was uh, Idomeni at uh, some of the heights of the, when we had about 10,000 people there. Uh, it kind of, so if you go to it, and if you're from a little bit of distance, it kind of feels like a festival camping, that kind of thing. But if you really look, uh, if you're really into it, it's, uh, it's a little bit more, uh, I think the word is sad, um, especially, for instance, if it's raining, it's just, it's not, it's not the place to be. And also you see children there, that kind of thing. So that was kind of horrible. Uh, now we see way much more different can, cans popping up because uh, the flow has uh, stopped, the, board, the borders has closed, so we need to look a little bit more like long-term. This is in Cordelio, this is in the north of uh, Greece, near, near Thessaloniki. Uh, another one is near, is near Gavala, that's also in the north. You see another tent kind of thing. Interesting about this picture is you, one of the things that you miss, uh, which is very important that kind of have in summer, is trees. Um, lots of uh, these camps in Greece are a military property. This is on an Air Force base. You kind of understand where there's not that many trees up there. Uh, but if so, if it's summer, you can understand it's pretty uh, rough uh, place to be there. Uh, another one, uh, Rizona, it's, it's north, of, uh, north of Athens. Again, lots of tents and that kind of thing. Uh, and the last bit is, uh, last one here is Kanamangas, which is also now near to um, uh, 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 Athens. And you see here, you see more of these uh, uh, container camps which do have air conditioning and that kind of thing in it. Here you see also an activity that we're trying to do there uh, to do, uh, we do some, some hygiene promotion with clowns and that kind of thing to uh, teach people that they need to wash their hands, that they need to uh, put the garbage in the garbage cans and that kind of thing to really start to stay healthy. Okay, we did basically, uh, now re I'm just uh, three slides. Uh, um, uh, we did this kind of thing, we tried to do it in two phases. Uh, phase one, really trying to get aerial imagery to do some uh, structural mapping of, uh, 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 yeah, you're going to be up here in a short minute and just drag me out of it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, to do this kind of structural image, uh, 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 mapping that we can trace uh, the containers and tents and that kind of thing. Uh, we kind of learned that not always uh, a recent aerial imagery is, was available or imagery was available, but you had clouds or lots of trees that kind of not really was helpful. Um, but since the camps are pretty small, we could re easily uh, get it done. So this is Escaramangas. Uh, I told you what it is. It's just a nice buildings kind of structure. This is Hedeso, it's also in the north. Uh, so these kind of things are on the map. The phase two, uh, this is the last slide. Um, so the phase two that we wanted to do is just get uh, the local community, the migrants who are living in these camps involved and get all the, inf uh, all the nice POIs and that kind of thing on uh, the map itself. What do they feel is important to be on the map? Uh, and they can maintain and they can also uh, uh, keep the map updated. So for, so for that, we wanted uh, to look at a, a group of local OSM volunteers who can help train people. And we found these in uh, a group of volunteers from the Hackerspace, Hackerspace in Greece. Uh, and you'll definitely know these people because uh, Dorothea, she's up there, uh, she's one of the uh, people there, and she's now also hired as the admin for the OpenStreetMap Foundation. So excellent, so uh, I think the OpenStreetMap Foundation did a very good job in hiring her. Um, so we're really happy with that. Then it's also like the kind of thing that we have local staff, so we can only advise um, the uh, Hellenic or the Greek Red Cross, like in we wanna do these kind of things. So we also need to try and convince these kind of things. And you sometimes have uh, difficulties like, well, yeah, well, 
people live here, so they kind of know where things are, so why do you want to put it on the map? It's really necessary. Da, da, da. Uh, so that's a slight uh, problem that we need to overcome. But uh, thirdly, I also see that it is pretty difficult in a formal camp because we need to get access to people to get on the map. We do not run the camp, so we, every time that we bring people onto the camp, we need to ask for access and permission to be there on it. Uh, so we went there like, hey, we have this great group of people who want to teach them to, to map. Uh, and then they kind of think like, oh, map, uh, I don't know. Uh, again, like I said, most of the camps are military properties. Uh, military are, mil mil militaries and uh, mapping uh, things are not really the nice combining stuff. Um, so that's a little bit of uh, uh, problematic there. So the second phase, uh, we're tri still trying to figure out how we can do that. Uh, but it's a little bit uh, difficult. So, uh, I hope, coming to the conclusion, um, we're trying to figure it out. Uh, maybe we're going to uh, get the experience and maybe look at different countries. Uh, but if, uh, 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 but um, uh, anyways, this is a nice experience that we wanted to do. Really committed in trying to make it together with the local communities. Um, and um, unfortunately, we were not completely successful in what we initially planned. But um, anyways, uh, we keep hope and hopefully next time we can do a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hank. Thank you, Katya. Sorry for rushing you, but we would like to, take ta to keep time for a few questions. So I think we can take two questions if there is anybody interested. Please raise your hand. Hello. Um, I'm here. <laughs> um, OK, thank you for your presentation. The two presentations were really interesting. But I, was, um, I just wanted to ask you about when you work with the communities, how, um, because you were speaking that you want to put people on the map, and then they say, what does this add to us, or how would that change. I'm asking about this discussion because I think it's pretty crucial. And when Katia was speaking in the, very, in the first place, I think that mapping, the mapping that you're working on is pretty political. And this um, political aspect has to be emphasized in a way when, like, I don't know, how do you emphasize it when you speak with the people? That it's not only about mapping where they are, but mapping also how do they live and those conditions, those inhuman conditions in a way, and um, also this um, mapping as, as a protest, you know, like as a saying that we are here, we are forced to be here in a way. Um, what is the water, what about um, their human needs, you know, like I think that their map would definitely be ma different than any other map of a beautiful European city or going with the ch school children in, in Europe asking them to draw their neighborhood. Um, I'm asking about that. I hope I'm clear. <laughs> um, so usually we got them to map by um, showing them a blank map of the camp from Google Maps and also from OpenStreetMap. Um, and this clearly uh, highlighted that they were not on any maps, so um, their needs and demands um, weren't seen anywhere. Um, so I think this uh, was made really sense to them to map where they were. Of course, I know it's a political issue and I have a very, um, yeah, I have my opinion about what's going on there and what might be improved, but it wasn't a political project. So it was really mainly to support the refugees, to find their ways in the camp, for the miners to know where the safe spaces are, um, and for new arrivals where to go, where to get legal counseling. So I really narrowed this down to very practical things. Um, yeah, that was basically it, because people are displaced, which also means they suffer um, from PTSD, and uh, displacement really means you have um, really big difficulties in um, adjusting to a situation, um, more than we usually do when we visit a new city. Uh, adding to that, and then uh, there's a, um, we also 
don't see the map as just a map and we can do with it. It's a vehicle of engaging with communities, engaging with people there to try and understand what is important for you, what do we need to do, how can we help, and giving people control over that process. So if they can map, like, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, if it's about security, if they feel not secure in several places, we can map, or they, or they, or they, they can map a lamppost or maybe cameras and that kind of thing, and then say, this is a place where we don't have these uh, things there, and that's why we feel unsafe there. So it's a vehicle to start a, com uh, to start a conversation how we can do better. And therefore, it's for us very important to have uh, the community itself take control over that map, uh, and that we're not going to say, you can map this and you can't map that. I hope that kind of answers your question. It's also um, really important for reporting um, because people get aware of uh, what's missing, like waste management and such things, which is uh, extremely important for the organizations working there. Oh, and we just uh, also just had fun <laughs> mapping, to be honest. Yeah, just uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, in the name of our governments, thank you for your uh, help and contribution in, in these uh, scenarios. Uh, just a quick question about, uh, is there a plan to also do open street view or with Mapillary, something like that, to actually uh, get, get a picture as well for each location so we can uh, do all like a little browsing around these, these uh, areas? Thanks. We had people from Mapillary on site, uh, but it is very difficult to take pictures in the camps. And I strongly uh, discourage everybody going there, just visiting the camps to even get out their smartphones to take a picture. Refugees don't want their um, faces shown. So, um, but the people I, sh I showed there uh, were our own pictures and um, we were allowed to take them. Um, maybe Larry was on site and they could take pictures, uh, not as many as they uh, were used to, but I really um, yeah, recommend you to look it up there. It's very impressive what they did, and they also released a blog post and a photo story. Okay, thank you again, and can catch.